Morning. Our, our discussion today is looking at whether the, the regulation that was introduced following the Great Recession, whether it uh, actually made the system safer or made it more risky. In other words, whether it future-proofed our system against further crises or whether it actually just served to encourage investors to put their money into riskier, less regulated assets. We have a fabulous panel of speakers who frankly don't need any introduction, but I'm going to go through this procedure and for the benefit of our online audience do that anyway. We have Larry Summers, one of America's leading economists, a former Treasury Secretary in the Clinton administration, a former economic advisor to President Barack Obama, and a former Chief Economist of the World Bank. We have Barbara Novick, who is the Vice Chairman of BlackRock, the world's biggest asset manager with $5 trillion in assets under management. Uh, and Barbara is in charge of uh, government relations and public policy. And we have Greg Metcraft, who is the head of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. Greg was chair of IOSCO, the global securities regulator, until May of last year. He is also a member of the Standing Committee on Supervisory and Regulatory Cooperation of the Financial Stability Board. Now everyone he here in this room and online knows that regulators have spent the best part of 10 years trying to fix the fault lines that caused the last financial crisis. We know that banks have become safer, they have higher capital buffers, lower leverage, and sounder risk management. But with tougher bank rules, this has meant that more money has shifted into the so-called shadow banking sector, a vast unregulated system in which non-bank lenders, be they asset managers or hedge, fund, hedge funds, or insurers provide credit and financial services. So I'd like to ask each of the panelists whether they think with this rise of so-called shadow banks, we have the roots of the next financial crisis. Larry, maybe I'd start with you. I think it's hard to argue that the system is not safer today than it was uh, years, than it was uh, 10 years ago. There's uh, more capital by many measures, there's very substantially uh, more liquidity. There are better procedures for resolving failed institutions. There's more transparency with respect to liabilities. There's more comprehensive regulation of uh, systemic institutions. There's better procedures for uh, international uh, cooperation. So I, I, I find untenable the argument that uh, no progress uh, has been made. At the same time, um, it does bear emphasis that if you look at a ratio that I've found relevant in some of my work, the market value of equity to the total value of assets mm -hmm. for large banks, it's lower than it was in the decade before the financial crisis, which suggests that the cushion is not all that we might think it is, because while we have mandated much more book capital, uh, the dynamic capital represented by future profitability in many cases has left uh, the industry. I think you're right to be concerned about uh, the movement of activities to uh, the shadow banking system. Though in many cases, um, the design of that activity makes it much less prone uh, to destabilizing runs. And in many cases, there is restraint exercised over the shadow banking system through regulation of uh, the traditional banking system. So if you say, do we have any basis for complacency? Uh, no. Are there important issues? Uh, of liquidity and functioning of markets in difficult circumstances that remain to be addressed, uh, yes. But uh, is this any moment for the wholesale repeal of the changes that have been made in the last eight years as suggested by some? No, I think that would be a grave mistake. Okay. Barbara, your view? So I would largely agree. Um, there's been an enormous amount of change and if you think about the crisis, it came down to a lot of different problems, but even some basic things like lack of data. Mm -hmm. So you roll it forward, and today I'd say there's been improvements on five areas. There's obviously the resiliency of the banking system itself, whether it's the capital, it's the liquidity, the oversight, lots of things there. 
Um, there's the OTC derivatives market going from a bilateral to a central clearing, more, more transparency, more capital, things like that. Um, third is the improvement in cash investing rules. A lot of the problems that we saw had to do with the reinvestment of cash and cash being defined very, very liberally. Um, that has been improved a lot. The reporting of data, just the registration alone of private funds. Up until the crisis, the, the SEC literally wouldn't know who to call as a large hedge fund manager or something like that. So having more data available, once you have the data, you can study it, you can figure out, do I have the right data, do I need more data? Um, and lastly is mutual fund rules themselves. So there's been a lot of discussion about shadow banking. I'm going to take exception to that phrase, say it's called market finance. Um, as Larry pointed out, it is subject to regulation. It's also less prone to the run risk of a bank. Um, and yet there's been all sorts of talk about whether all these <coughs> bank rules have reduced liquidity. I'll simply point out that in the last week we've seen record earnings from a number of broker dealers, all of which refer to their very strong trading um, after the election, bond trading in particular. So I think the scenario where bonds were going to stop trading, that there was no market liquidity, et cetera, et cetera, because of all these bank regulations, we're seeing that that's just not accurate. Um, in fact, there is trading. Some trading has moved to electronic trading. Some other things have changed in how people manage money. But the downside scenario of increasing resiliency has not materialized. Greg? Well, uh, look, I completely agree with the, the comments of, of Larry and Barbara. Um, particularly, one of the things I have is I really don't like the term um, shadow banking. I, I, I think it brings the wrong connotation. I really strongly opposed to it. And the FSB doesn't use that term anymore. They actually do focus on sustainable market-based financing. So I think that's what we've got to be focused on. And secondly, to the point is, actually, market-based financing is regulated. It's regulated by market regulators like myself. So, and I think it's not regulated by banks, or like banks, but it's different. And I think the other thing at the mo that we've got to think about is that we have a long-term structural change occurring around the world, which is the, actually, growth in, in basically savings in the pension fund sector. And generally, what that flows into is not necessarily banks, it actually flows into markets. So you've got both a, a probably, a, if you want, a cyclical a change occurring here or impact, but also a structural change. So, But I do think, uh, I agree, I do think we are a lot more resilient than we were at the crisis, um, you know, in terms of uh, being able to plan for, for shocks and, and volatility. I think the crisis was a wake-up call for, for regulators. Uh, I think it showed that we needed to cooperate a lot more. We needed to be far more proactive and forward-looking in looking at emerging risks, what's coming down, thinking about stress testing. But I think we did respond with things like the um, you know, the too big to fail principles that the FSB worked on, the, as Barbara mentioned, the OTC derivative market reforms, dealing with, uh, we we'll use the word back, backward shadow banking, but starting to think about, it, it's actually, that's why it's sustainable market-based financing, how it, it is a good source, let's not kill it, let's make sure that it's safe. And there have been changes, like mentioned, on mutual funds, etc. But also, um, you know, the, the area of just simply just cooperating <coughs> more globally, I think, has been really important um, as well. So, it, but, but in terms of perhaps uh, some of the movements uh, to market-based financing, some of the um, things that people are buying, you know, high-yielding instruments, etc. I don't, I actually think a lot of that's coming really more from the, the lowering of interest rates and the search for yield is, is creating perhaps dysfunctional behaviour. So I, I don't think it's really necessarily just the fact that of the changes from the crisis. So we're not worried about, you know, the growth of open-ended mutual market funds or, you know, there's quite a big growth in private credit funds. Are there, you know, issues around there, you know, in terms of investors losing out, fire sales? Well, at the end of the day, it's very simple. You know, it, markets versus banks are very different. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, markets, uh, you invest in a market instrument, you can, you can actually make a lot of money or you can lose a lot of money. So it's very different to putting your money in the bank. So what we always say is that, you know, at the end of the day, um, that markets, when you invest, uh, disclosure, and, you know, the biggest thing is actually, if, if you don't understand it, don't buy it. And, and markets also it can be volatile. So I do think, again, though, it does mean that we've got to make sure that those products are sold to the right customers is really important. And I think that's something that a lot of us are now focusing on, is making sure 
that suitability, I think, is really important, that the right party gets that, it gets the right investment. That's generally our attitude. So you make a good point, people should know what, what they're buying, oh, right? Yeah. It's critical. But do you think, I mean, maybe Barbara, you can answer this, do you think the average retail investor in the, in the US realizes you know, what their mutual fund is investing in? Um, two different questions. Um, for, first thing is your, your private credit fund question. So part of looking at funds is understanding how are those funds structured. So most private credit funds are actually structured as private vehicles. They may have gates, they may have side pockets, they may have redemption terms that are designed to address the liquidity or illiquidity of those assets. And so you can't lump private credit funds with mutual funds. Sure. Yeah. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing is, when you look at mutual funds, there's tons of disclosure. Whether people read every word of a prospectus is highly questionable, but certainly the information is made available. I'd say more and more investors are being educated, are aware. They can go to sources like Morningstar. They can you know, use an advisor. I'd say that the level of awareness of what they're getting is increasing, not decreasing. Mm -hmm. But Larry, for you then, where would you see the risks right now in the financial system? It's very hard to, very hard uh, to know. I'm not quite as certain as some others that um, the risks have been entirely removed from the large banks, um, particularly in Europe. Yeah. I think there are substantial risks um, of a crisis in some ways, like the crises that hit a number of emerging market Asia countries uh, in the 90s um, taking place uh, in China. I think that we've introduced enormous uncertainty into the U.S. outlook with the kind of rhetoric that uh, the president-elect is engaged in. That could set off uh, a cascading decline uh, in, uh, in markets. I think there's risk of a big increase in risk premiums on longer-term bonds, mm. and uh, if long-term rates were to spike upwards, mm -hmm. that could cause uh, quite substantial uh, dislocations. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's some grounds for concern about uh, liquidity at the moments when you need it most, yeah. um, when there's a great deal of strain mm -hmm. uh, in markets. So I think those are all um, risks, I'm not sure the greatest risks we face right now mm -hmm. are of future financial crisis, but all of those would seem to me to be causes for concern. You mentioned the European banking system. Do you think this, the, the rescue of Monte de Paschi sort of showed that uh, the architecture that was set up in Europe has, has failed? You know, you could argue that was a bank that really should have been put into resolution. <laughs> I, I think each, each context is different. I tend to I tend to believe that there's um, some inherent need not to have protocols and to improvise mm -hmm. in times of financial crisis. I think of failed finan failing financial institutions as in many ways being like kidnaps. Mm -hmm. You want to solve the problem by paying ransom, but you don't want to set terrible precedents. Mm -hmm. and, but it's, and so you could say in principle, the government should have bans on paying ransom mm. um, so that they don't ever do it, but actual governments don't find themselves able to be able to stick with that regimen. And so I think something not dissimilar is present with respect to financial bailouts. Mm -hmm. Greg, your view on this, I mean, you, you headed up IOSCO until last year. Mm -hmm. What is the sort of, what's your biggest regret? What's the piece of regulation that you wish had gone through that didn't? I'm being an ex-investment banker. I'm not really in favour of my next piece of regulation. I'm afraid. Uh, so, but I, I do think uh, that uh, I, in the area of infrastructure, capital markets, one area, and in securitisation, it's not so much about regulation. But I do think both those areas have uh, a huge amount of potential in capital markets. And I must say. I'm a big fan of seeing the way you can expand those markets around the world in capital markets. And one way, I think, is standardisation. So I, I am a big fan of, of sort of standardising more 
um, to broaden the investor base. And to your point about liquidity, because I always get annoyed when people talk about illiquid markets being an ex-investment banker, the, the corporate bond markets, and whether it's these at the ABS market or infrastructure, you know, the way you truly develop markets is to think about how you make them agency markets rather than principal markets. And, you know, the, the, the thing of actually having banks holding lots of bonds on their portfolio, generally they're not there when you need liquidity. What you need is sustainable, liquid markets. And, and actually what people have got to do is think about what investors need, not what issuers need. And pre-crisis, we were too focused on what issuers wanted. So I do think in some respects it's healthy, I think, now bond markets in terms of thinking how do you build sustainable uh, markets. So, And uh, there is debate about whether there is liquidity issues in, in bond markets. But I do think that, though, you know, Securitisation, infrastructure, I think, are the two ones that I, I'd like to see more because I think in terms of funding economic growth, um, I think both those markets um, have enormous potential to help fund economic growth, right, infrastructure, because infrastructure really, really from a longer term perspective, really can't be funded sustainably from the banks because of capital and liquidity requirements. So actually opening it up more to, you know, pension funds, insurance companies, etc., you know, I think is, is a great opportunity and equally, Banks are having trouble funding uh, themselves these days, so the more that you can actually fund consumption through uh, securitization markets, as they do in the United States, um, I think this can actually help um, help a lot more in terms of funding economic growth. So that's why those things are important. So you mean the introduction of rules that would standardise securitization as a way of boosting... Personally, I don't like actually forcing rules. Mm -hmm. I actually rather, you know, having rent the, you know, the American Securitization Forum, I'm much more about having industry and coming in behind industry developing their standards that are appropriate for the market. And it's one of the things that ASCO is doing at the moment with the industry, looking to establish sort of standards in terms of various asset classes. So I think, you know, the more that actually that you can get industry to, to push forward on this, I think it would be good. But actually helping, being a catalyst, I think, mm -hmm. is, is important. Now, there is work underway, Ryan Rick, but it is, I think you've got to really, it's sometimes a bit like herding cats. But it's important long-term work, and I, I think you know it does contribute to the, the developing the global economy. Barbara, you get asked about risk all the time. Uh, where do you see it in the market? Where, where should people be worried? So I would identify um, three areas. One is the market plumbing, right? So things like CCPs, while we've taken the risk out of banks and put it into mm. the CCPs, mm. that's a good thing but we need to make the CCPs themselves resilient. Yeah. And we can't think that we made, waved a magic wand, the risk disappeared, no, the risk is now more concentrated. And it's more transparent, it's manageable, mm. but it needs to be addressed. And that's something that is actively being discussed yes. right now. I mean, it, that's on the table. Yeah. Um, the second is an area that doesn't get discussed much at all, which is pension funds. Mm -hmm. We have a worldwide um, crisis coming in terms of underfunding. Uh, the WEF is actually putting out a report on the defined contribution side, and I think it's a, a very, very important area. If you think about what will happen if some of these funds run out of money and there's no money to pay benefits. Um, we're not talking about just cutting benefits, but just running out of money. I think that's a huge issue. Um, the FSB touches on it in its recent uh, report and something, an area yeah. to look at. And then third is cybersecurity. Yeah. And um, you know, you just can't avoid putting that on a short list. It is something that every company is dealing with, mm -hmm. not just in financial services, but every type of company. And it's a very real risk, and you have to be constantly vigilant. So you mentioned the, the central clearing houses. Um, they are subject to stress tests, but we don't actually hear much about them. There's not much sort of transparency in the way that there is, say, in the annual bank, stre bank stress tests, both in Europe and in America. Should there be more transparency around the, the stress tests of central clearing houses, do you think, Barbara? Um, they're not actually mandatory on stress testing mm -hmm. yet. It's something that's coming into being. There's also some questions on how much capital they have, what is the waterfall in the event you had a resolution, um, things like that. So there's active conversations globally. Mm -hmm. I think all regulators realize, or po all policy people realize, we do need to make them more resilient. And there's a number of different dimensions of that. And I think we're going to get there in the, probably 2017 or so. I can comment on that. Sure. Up until recently, I was chairman of CPMI OSCO. Right. <laughs> so in fact, we are developing standards for stress testing and also 
stress testing at the individual level, but also more global stress testing working with FSB. So that is all underway. And I do think the issue is these, in, these I'm very supportive of, we've, got a, we've created these vehicles and we've got to make sure that, that everyone has trust and confidence that if you want, they're too, you know, they are, they will be resilient. So they should never actually fail. So I do think the efforts are going underway at the moment are really important. So, but it is happening and, and it should be transparent. I agree with you. So we're obviously discussing financial regulation on the same day that uh, a US president who has pledged to dismantle Dodd-Frank is about to be inaugurated. Um, Larry, maybe I could ask you about what you think Donald Trump will do to, to US regulation and the impact it may have on, on global, global economic security. I have to say that I am struck by the contrast between the tone of this dialogue where people may or may not completely agree, but they seek to bring evidence forward in support of the things they believe. They listen to the positions of others. They're prepared to change uh, their minds. And a great deal of what passes for economic dialogue in Washington as the new administration transits to power. I think policy making by tweet is likely to be a substantial danger to economic performance over time. I think regulatory policies framed by what is felt by regulators rather than what is thought by regulators huh. are likely to be uh, dangerous over time. And I think the propensity to general sweeping and passionate rhetoric mm -hmm. on uh, technical matters is unlikely to be helpful, whether it comes from the left uh, or uh, from uh, the right. So more than I'm focused on any particular change mm -hmm. that may or may not happen, uh, with respect to Died Frank, I am focused on the need for continuing thoughtful, internationally, uh, internationally worked out, comprehensive, complex to reflect a complex yeah. world uh, regulation. And I think the propensity to reduce regulatory debates to slogans that fit into 140 characters is a very troubling propensity. Greg, you're an international regulator. Um, how worried are people internationally about the sort of the rhetoric that's coming out of the US as it pertains to regulation? I mean, there's, sure, there's lots sure. of rhetoric, but let's focus on I, financial regulation. I think to Larry's point, I mean, at the end of the day, it's too early to tell, but I do, big concern I have, and that's not, not with not just with what's happening in America, but it, fragmentation really worries me, which is, you know, or, you know, inconsistent approaches to really what are global markets. So I do think one thing we're gonna have to be very, very, it's gonna be really important to explain what we do, right, in, in the future, I think, and why, why we need to do it this way. Because, and it, you know, if you don't have globally coordinated markets in, and that, that stops the flow of capital, that's not good for anybody, right? So what we want is free flow of capital. So, you know, get, making sure we remain consistent and explain the story, I think is really important. Just other two other things, another related to that, technological developments are huge. And I think getting, developing, say, global approaches and standards to say, you know, digital identity or interoperability and blockchain, this is all stuff that, it, it's global and it's gonna have to be continued to be global. Even things, cyber security, I agree, is the number one big risk, I think, to the markets, mm -hmm. right? Again, making sure that the big issue at the moment is interdependencies. People don't really think about what, how interdependent they are, right? That often the thing that's gonna blow you up is actually not maybe within yourself, but somebody you've got an independency on. So I think that, uh, I, I actually think that we've actually just gotta, again, there is gonna be change. You've gotta explain why we do what we do, and, and I think, and be adaptable and flexible. And I do think also, um, one of the things with financial service, I do think inclusiveness is going to be really important and not thinking about, 
governments have got to not think about the one size fits all. It's got to be a lot more proportionate, you know, for emerging markets. Uh, and that's where I think we have gone a bit wrong over the last few years is we've tried to make it a one size fits all rather than actually thinking with your little market, okay, you've got to be a bit more proportional in terms. So that might, I think that might be probably a very good development in terms of pushing perhaps a bit more flexibility. So look, I think I'm always half glass full sort of guy, right? So, you know. Barbara, for you, how do you see the, the US financial regulation changing in the next few years? So I couldn't agree more with Larry. Uh, policy doesn't fit in 144 characters. The devil is in the details. You could say things like, I'm in favor of a fiduciary standard. That's a good thing. Then you could look at hundreds of pages of the rule that was passed and say, well, this doesn't really solve the problem or this creates new problems. So the devil's in the details. You could have a good idea and it's almost like in business, you say, well, I need a business strategy, but I also need a good execution. Mm -hmm. In policy, same thing. It should be data driven. It should be based on fact. It should be based on expertise in the area, really digging down and, and understanding. Um, when you say things like Don Frank going away, there's no proposal in Congress or anywhere in Washington to make it go away. Yeah. There are proposals to address it and make changes to it, but that's very different. So I think it'll be an interesting 2017 and beyond, and uh, we're looking forward to working with the new administration. Well, the markets certainly seem to expect uh, there's going to be some sort of deregulation. We've seen quite a run-up in the share prices of the banks. Do you think investors may be getting ahead of themselves, maybe reading too much into it? You talk to some people here and they seem to think it'll be the smaller banks that will benefit. You know, the larger banks may not actually uh, gain as much as they hope. I would call it let's right size regulation yeah. rather than let's deregulate. I don't think we want to take all these things off the table. They were put there for a reason, but in some cases, the pendulum has simply swung too far. Yeah. So let's right size it. Let's make sure that we're not sweeping up everyone with one size fits all rules. Let's make sure we're combining some supervision and responsibility for supervision, accountability for supervision with rules that are maybe a little simpler. You know, it's almost like the analogy is the tax code. In the United States, the tax code, I think you could put a book on the bottom, you know, paper on the bottom, and pile them up and, and you'd go past the ceiling. That's our tax code. No one can read all that and actually understand all that. Maybe if that's your full-time job. Well, we now have stacks of paper like that for every one of these categories. It's just too much. No, that's right. I agree with that completely. You know, both domestically and globally, you've got to think more proportionately, one, not one size. It, that, it, if anything comes out of the next few years, that should be the big thing, particularly, say, SME sector, making it a lot easier. I agree. So we're certainly seeing more fragmentation. Um, maybe just one last question. We are certainly seeing one more fragmentation in, in the kind of global regulatory landscape. One thing that the US and, and Europe are, are at odds over is how you measure the riskiness of a bank's assets. <clears throat> Larry, do you think we're going to have any agreement on that this year uh, between the US and the Europe? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I think we probably need to put more reliance on market values mm -hmm. and attempts to gauge market values yeah. and less emphasis on accounting values. I yeah. think one of the quite disturbing things that has come out um, of the reviews of the crisis has been the number of institutions that failed whose regulators were busy explaining up to and past the day when they failed how splendidly capitalized they were. Yeah. And I think that counsels more emphasis on liquidity. I think it also counsels some care in uh, the measurement of, uh, of capital. So my big takeaways from today's discussions is I'm going to get horrible looks if I use the term shadow banking, um, that the market-based financing is perhaps not as risky as, sustainable. as we feared. Sustainable. 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 Uh, there are, how, you know, we are definitely in a, in a safer place as far as the banks are concerned. We have comprehensive regulation. But there are some risks out there, and I think you've named them, you know, cyber security, yeah. uh, central clearing houses, um, mm. the risk of regulatory fragmentation, and perhaps you know, most poignant of all in today, given the day that's in it, uh, sort of the, the rhetoric that is coming out of some countries as it pertains to regulation. And I think we've got to watch technological development mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that it doesn't 
get ahead of us too fast because usually when that happens we have problems right so I think we've got to watch that one there'll probably be all robots here in a few years doing this panel well, as long as the robots we watch the algorithms that are behind <laughs> them we'll, we'll be fine right but let's you know it's all, the person behind always is going to be responsible for that algorithm we've got to think about make sure we get that right, That's right. so Greg Barbara Larry thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you.